Welcome to First Evangelical Free Church in Maplewood, Minnesota, and our Sunday Sermon Series. Dr. Todd Olson is our senior pastor, and currently he's taking us through a series in Deuteronomy entitled, A Promise and a Journey. And now here's Pastor Todd with this week's message. Good morning and welcome to everyone who's worshiping with us here at First Free. We have one church family. We worship in a couple of different venues in the activity center as well as in the worship center, and we're glad that you're all with us here this morning to worship the Lord and to hear from him through his word. You'll want to take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 16. There are Bibles on the back of your chairs as well. And you can access chapter 16 of the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. Even that section, albeit briefly, there's a larger section that's referenced under the sermon title from chapter 15, verse 19 to 16, verse 17. We have been producing a number of different resources. Uh, Call them supplements. They're on the back of your sermon notes almost weekly. We're making them available up on the website on a tab under resources as well. And there is a forum coming up in a couple of weeks that's going to try to weave a, a, a thread through a number of the things that we've talked about. You can read about that on the back side of your first free today, the front cover, on May 15th. You'll know in particular that we are in the middle of Moses' second sermon. We'll end his second sermon on May 30th. And the section that we're in, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 12 through 26, follow the outline of the Ten Commandments which are given earlier in the book of Deuteronomy, but here is a spelling out of how the Ten Commandments are to work in the life of the people of Israel in the Old Testament as they're getting ready to go into the Promised Land. And in particular, the last couple of weeks on giving and on worship are tied in with this morning's message on the festivals and the worship life of the people of Israel as reflected in the first three commandments, which are vertical, loving God, keeping the Sabbath, serving Him. In preparation for this morning, and as a form of introduction to what we're going to look at here in a few minutes, we made a recording earlier in the week, and I have you turn your attention to the screens and listen very carefully to what is talked about for eight minutes. It's eight minutes long, so don't disengage uh, partway through. Listen very carefully uh, to what uh, we have to share with you that was recorded earlier this week as an introduction to this morning. Good morning, First Free. I'm sitting here earlier in the week with Dr. Phil Luke, and we've been brainstorming and talking and planning about the whole Deuteronomy series as well as a longer-range, multi-year series in the Bible. And uh, one of the things that we've talked about, Dr. Luke, personally, is that it's so very important for every believer at First Free, every Christian, to be growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our desire at First Free that everyone would grow deeper in their relationship with the Lord and His Word so that we could reach out farther into the world around us. As we've been interacting on multiple occasions, you have said that there are two key questions that need to be in our minds as Christians in the world today. Can you introduce us to those questions again? I think we as the people of God at First Free need to continually remind ourselves of what in the world God is doing. Uh, We have reflected on that and that's in our mission statement. But in addition, the corollary question to that big one is what is our specific part collectively as a church and individually as a personal believer uh, in carrying out what God is doing. Yeah. So to do that, though, we have to be equipped. And to help us equip ourselves, we've been working through six keys, as I've called them in the supplements. And the first one we gave out two weeks ago, it's getting a focus on God's Word. Yeah. The second one, which was given a week ago, was on understanding the concepts of dispensation, covenant, and kingdom of God so that we can see the big picture as far as scripture is concerned. And there's a shorter version of that supplement. And by the way, folks, all these supplements are in the back of your sermon notes week after week. We're eventually going to put them in a booklet. They're available on the resource tab on our website. But that second supplement uh, we had available just recently. 
Yeah, and that second one has an extended four-page version. That's right. Yeah, so that was available on the counter, and I noticed last week a lot of folks picking that up, which is encouraging. Uh, the third one was the whole idea of the continuity between the Old and the New Testament. For example, um, how much of the Old is old and how much of the new is new. And there's pertinence to that one, this third one, continuity, discontinuity, in the message that I'm preaching this morning on the festivals, the yes. feasts. Uh, how did the feast, the three spring feasts that you're going to uh, focus on, how did they inform Israel as to her own salvation history, as yep. it's sometimes called? And how did the New Testament, this is the fourth key, New Testament use of the old, how did they see this? Well, they saw it in terms of number five, typology. Yep. The idea that there is embedded in the history of Israel persons or events or institutions or uh, actions uh, that prefigure or foreshadow some aspect of the person and work of Jesus Amen. in the New Testament. Yep. So you're going to bring that out for us this morning. In addition, then our sixth and final key will be pulling these first five together and asking how does God's sovereignty fit into all of this? Yep. Uh, you've got uh, an illustration about real estate. Talk to me about real estate. <laughs> well, getting equipped in terms of getting a focus uh, is often uh, made, the analogy is made of the successful real estate agent uh, emphasizes location, location, location. Uh, a house will sell if it's in the right location. Yep. Well, a good successful student of Scripture understands context, context, context. There are three contexts that you have been dealing with uh, from the beginning of your series. The historical background of the book, yep. uh, who wrote it, when was it written, to whom was it written, why was it written, uh, and all of that has been an informed framework within which each weekly sermon has been played out. Uh, the second context is the literary context, and that's the book itself in terms of the type of literature. Uh, Deuteronomy, basically narrative, but with a strong hortatory or exhortation, uh, and from the outline... Uh, that we have given out, Dan, Dr. Dan Blocks. Uh, it's a uh, sermonic or three sermons right. that preacher Moses or pastor Moses as he ministered to his people, in a sense giving them his prep talks for them as they get uh, ready to go into the promised land. So it's against these kinds of backgrounds that the third context is given significance, and that's the theological. Right. So that we understand the progress of God's redemptive purpose and plan across the whole of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation yeah. and how Deuteronomy fits in there and in terms of the Old Testament, how it relates to the New. So we're beginning to see in the process of the forest for the trees. That's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Please, dear people of First Free, take advantage of the resources that are on the web, the handouts that are on the back of your sermon notes regularly now, uh, some expanded handouts. Uh, one of my desires as a pastor is to help our people, uh, especially in our evangelical churches where we have a love for the Word, to make sure that we don't think that uh, uh, what we do is come to church every week or open our Bibles and look for a little crumb that we can apply to our lives, we have to go deeper than that. Uh, we can't just walk around with a bucket full of crumbs and think we're growing in our relationship with the Lord. God we uses really everything. Want, Pastor, Pardon? is big, thick slices of the loaf of glory. That's what we need. Big, <laughs> thick slices of the loaf of glory and help put these crumbs together, help put these pieces together in a substantive way so that our spiritual, spirituality would be authentically biblical and spiritually robust. Amen. 
That's our desire, and that's what we want to see happen here at First Free. Well, this morning, in this morning's message, we're going to be talking about these three spring feasts or festivals uh, and talking about celebrating covenant relationship with Yahweh. Dr. Luke, I want to say to you how much I have come to deeply appreciate you as a friend and a brother in Christ. I love your commitment to the Lord personally, your love for him, and your love for his church his church as it meets here at First Free and as we continue to grow in relationship with one another so that we would all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, growing deeper, reaching farther out into the world. Turn your attention now, everyone, please, uh, to the Word of God as we open it up this morning in the continued series in the book of Deuteronomy. If you've come this morning and uh, maybe you're here for one of the first few times or have been here for a long time and your desire is, you know, I want a takeaway, I want a takeaway. You're going to get the takeaway this morning, but you have to hang on for a few minutes. So I want you to listen in these next 30 minutes and you're going to begin to see the takeaway and it's going to be a whole lot more than just, can I grab some little crumb that I can apply to my life today? The takeaway is going to be in relationship to how God has a massive plan that started in eternity past and is headed somewhere in the future, that you're not insignificant in that plan. And the other takeaway is that the Scriptures cannot be treated like a mystical book that we look for some sort of mysterious, spiritualized kind of meaning in it. Words have meaning. The Scriptures have meaning. This book is well worth studying. It is wonderfully put together by the big A author, the Holy Spirit. And we have to handle it carefully. And so I pray that that will come across this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 15, the end of verse uh, chapter 15, starting at verse 19. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to read 16, 1 to 8. But this all has to do with this continuing topic of celebrating covenant relationship with Yahweh, the God of the Bible. My subtitle, The Worship Life of the People of God. And we can learn from their worship life. We see in verse 19 of chapter 15 and down through verse 23 that the firstborn male of the flock are to be dedicated to the Lord, eaten before the Lord your God year by year, eaten within their towns. They're not supposed to eat the blood. All of this may seem a little foreign to us. Why does the law in the Old Testament involve animals? In this sacrificial system, two reasons. They were a nomadic, agricultural environment, number one. And number two, these forms of sacrifice needed to be blood-centered. That was God's plan as we get to the cross and the blood of Jesus. Therefore, animals were included. Now we pick up this morning on the first of three festivals. We're only going to read chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then I'm going to turn our attention Here's the takeaway. Listen carefully. I'm going to turn our attention to the question. What do the Old Testament feasts have to do with us? We're Christians. We're not Jewish people. We're not Old Testament believers. How do we, as Christians, read the Old Testament Christianly? Or do I just take this book, you see it, and say, two-thirds of it doesn't apply to me? So how do we handle... This section on the feasts, and how do we read it Christianly, and what's the takeaway for us? So let's take a look at one of the only uh, of the three feasts that we're going to emphasize this morning. Observe chapter 16, verse 1, the month of Aviv. It's also called in the Jewish candle calendar Nisan 14. It's the first month of the year. Observe the month of Aviv and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Aviv, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt at night, by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt... In haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days. 
Nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. Eat it all, in other words. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice the way you want, my comment, insertion, within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. Just pause and listen. Keep your finger there in the text. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, if you were here, you can go online and listen, that in Deuteronomy... 21 times Moses uses the place name formula. The place formula. In chapter 12, it was the first time. 21 times he talks about a place. He doesn't name the place. We know ultimately the place is Jerusalem and the temple. Temporarily the place is Shiloh. What's the whole point? Why does he keep saying, don't do this in your own towns? You need to go to the place that I mentioned. The reason why is they're getting this prep talk, this pep talk, and as they go into the promised land, they're going to divide up into 12 tribes. They're going to settle in 12 different areas. There'll be Canaanites all around them. There'll be altars of worship all around them to pagan cultic worship. And Moses is preparing them and saying, no, 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 no. Don't buy in. To the gods of the Canaanites, don't compromise, don't intermarry with the pagans. But you are to worship at a place, and as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, far more important than the place was the person, the person whose name is there. So, at the place that the Lord your God, verse 6, will choose to make his name dwell in it, there you shall offer the Passover sacrifice. When? In the evening, at sunset. Why? At the time you came out of Egypt, at night, in the dark. You shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly like a Sabbath. To the Lord your God you shall do no work on it. And so we have here in this first of the three festivals or feasts that we're going to look at. And I'll just reference the other two very briefly. We see here and identify a principle that God is giving to them a festival or a feast that will remind them that God is the one who makes the way for deliverance. He brought them out of Egypt. He's going to bring them into the promised land. God is the one who makes the way for deliverance. And we're introduced to the Passover in Hebrew, Pesach. Connected to it, a fourth feast under the Passover because it came a day after this. Uh, The celebration of unleavened bread. I'm sorry, it didn't come a day afterwards, but the celebration of unleavened bread. Pentecost came a day after the uh, Feast of Weeks that we'll see here in just a second. But there was the Passover, Pesach, in verses 1 and 2. And then in verses 3 and 4, we're introduced to another feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag Hamatzot. And some of you have been around Jewish people even today who might eat matzah. Or you've heard of matzah bread, unleavened bread. Here's where it comes from, unleavened bread. And I mentioned this place formula. And you see the people of Israel being told by Moses, when you go into the promised land, at the place that I tell you, celebrate the Passover. Eat this matzah bread. Celebrate the unleavened bread and that feast and celebration. Be reminded that God is the one who makes the way for deliverance and salvation. That's all we're going to talk about the Passover this morning. Verses 1 to 8. Now, travel with me, if you will, because we're going to get to typology in just a minute. Travel with me, if you will, to a couple of other passages that help us make the bridge from the then to the now. The then, for them, a reminder of their deliverance. Celebrate the Passover over and over again. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. It's a suffering servant. A prophecy from the Old Testament pointing to the Messiah and Jesus in the New Testament. We're not going to read verses 1 through 9. I just want to read for us verse 7. But you know that this describes the Messiah, the arm of the Lord who would be revealed, the Messiah. He had no former majesty that we should look at him. Nothing compelling about his looks. He was despised, rejected, and so on. Bore our griefs and sorrows. Wounded for our transgressions, verse 5. Crushed for our iniquities. The Lord... God, Yahweh, the one true God of the Bible, will lay on him, his son, the Messiah, one day, all of our sin. Notice verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb. Bingo. 
In the mind of Isaiah's readers, they think back to what? Instantly, the Messiah, the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter. Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And then we venture over to the New Testament, Scripture, interpreting Scripture. It's very important, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 6, 7, and 8. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? The Apostle Paul, writing to the church that's primarily Jewish believers in Jesus the Messiah, you mentioned leaven, bingo, lights come on. They think back to the Old Testament. They think back to Passover and to the festival of unleavened bread, matzah. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. Here's the key phrase. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So we look to the Old Testament and the passage that we have before us and we ask the question, what, if anything, does this have to do with us? Just set aside the Old Testament? No, we have the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. And we read the book of Deuteronomy, and we come to this section about festivals, and we still ask the same question. But then we start working our way through the scriptures, and we come to Isaiah, and we see a lamb's going to be sacrificed on the cross. We get over to the New Testament, and Paul tells us that the fulfillment of the Passover is in Christ and in him. All seven of the festivals, and I'll just very, very quickly introduce the other two in just a minute. All seven of the festivals in the Old Testament, hear this very clearly, foreshadow who Jesus is, and they all find their fulfillment ultimately in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so we come to this significant festival of Passover and of weeks, and of unleavened bread. The feasts for the people of Israel capture their history and their life each and every year, from Egypt to the Promised Land. And that kind of picture foreshadows the bondage that Christ has brought us out of from sin to new life in Him. Amen? And it pictures the day that one day we'll ultimately go into the new heavens and the new earth where there'll be ultimate relationship with the God who has created us. We look at the Passover and we find its fulfillment in Jesus even in communion. We're encouraged and challenged to regularly celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And when we come to the Lord's Supper once a month here at First Free, I pray that we would never, even after this message, never come to it and think this is some incidental thing. And we just need to have a communion. It's a Christian thing. No, it's not primarily a Christian thing. It's a Christian thing that hearkens our hearts and our minds all the way back to the big picture of God that I'll paint for us a little bit more here in just a minute. So we think of communion and we're reminded, even in communion, of past history for the people of Israel, of present history for us as we continue to be transformed from our sin into the likeness of Jesus and of our future transformation. Now, I'm going to very, very quickly mention the other two feasts. Thank you for hanging in there. And then we're going to take a look at a brief introduction to typology. You'll have to think carefully with me. And then we'll drive it home a little bit more in the so what for each of us. Now, notice the second feast is the Feast of Weeks, also called Harvest. It's seven weeks. That's 49 days. You add one more day, you have 50. You have Pentecost in the book of Acts in the New Testament. It's called Shavuot. And they bring offerings freely from their will before the Lord. You read about the last of these three feasts that are mentioned here in verses 13 through 7, the Feast of Booths. It's also called the Feast of Tabernacles uh, or the Feast of Ingathering. It's not gathering in the grain from the field, but it's taking an offering, gathering the offering and bringing it to the Lord like thanksgiving in our history and our culture. And it's called the Feast of Booths or Ingathering or Harvest or Tabernacles. The word for booths in Hebrew is Sukkoth and you can learn and read and study about the Feast of Tabernacles in the book of Leviticus here being summarized in the book of Deuteronomy. References to the future. Interestingly, I'll just say this and I mentioned it in your notes, but do you know that in the Millennial Kingdom, 
in the millennial kingdom according to the book of Zechariah chapter 14 verses 16 through 19 we will be celebrating the feast of booze or ingathering in the millennial kingdom you can just take that as a teaser and think about it as you reflect on the feasts and study them on your own Zechariah 14 16 to 19 is well worth reading sometime today now here we go and continue on in the message, and I know this is challenging us to put on our thinking caps a little bit, but I'm uh, going to present to us now why I think the Old Testament feasts have something to do with us as Christians and how we are to read the Old Testament Christianly. Okay? So just wiggle around a little bit, take a breath, and allow me to share four things with you, first an introduction and then the four things. The early New Testament church, primarily still being Jewish, used as a primary method, typology, for understanding the Old Testament. They were familiar with what I'm going to tell you now in the next few minutes and what we'll talk about in a supplement in a couple of weeks and at the forums and so on. The early New Testament believers in Jesus who are primary Jewish understood typology. So what is it? Four things. Ready? Number one, a type is a model or a pattern... A type is a model or a pattern with its anti-type in the New Testament. A type is a model or a pattern that has an anti-type in the New Testament and the anti-type adds to, explains, and even escalates the meaning of what was being taught in the Old Testament in the type. The feasts are types. And I'll show how in just a minute. A type is a model or a pattern with an anti-type in the New Testament that adds to or escalates the meaning. But catch this, very important. We do not know the Old Testament type is a type until we read about it in the New Testament. I can't just take my Bible in the Old Testament and come up with all kinds of mystical, mysterious, individual applications and meanings that's not how you read the Bible. Remember, one of our two takeaways is, how do we handle the Scriptures accurately? I do not know that an Old Testament type is a type until I get to the New Testament, and the New Testament tells me that the Old Testament is a type. So we have the Feast of Passover, and we have Isaiah chapter 53, and a lamb who was slaughtered, and we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're told Christ is the anti-type, and he fulfills the Passover. Time doesn't allow it this morning, but we could go into a detailed study on all seven of the feasts, and you'll see that they are types, and the anti-type, the fulfillment that brings to full meaning, comes in the person and the work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So a type is a model or a pattern with an anti-type in the New Testament that adds to it. And we don't know that the Old Testament is a type until we read about it in the New Testament. I personally adhere to the position that Dr. Kaiser does, who was here some time back, that when it comes to the Old Testament, there aren't hidden multiple meanings that the author may or may not know, but there is single meaning in the text God's superintending all of it, but single meaning in the text. We'll come back to that on a number, uh, another occasion. Number two, we need to keep distinct in our minds prophecy and typology. Second point under a brief introduction to typology. And don't worry, I'll get to the so what in a minute here, a little bit more. We need to keep distinct prophecy and typology. There are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament where there is explicit verbal prediction that connects the Old Testament to the New Testament. So you read an explicit, verbal, written prophecy in the Old Testament, and it finds its fulfillment in the New Testament. That is not typology. That's Bible prophecy. So we have Bible prophecy, and that's important. But typology is non-verbal in the Old Testament. Moses is not saying to the people of Israel, hey, by the way, this is a prophecy that one day a lamb is going to come, Isaiah will write about him, and ultimately his name will be Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. That would be a prophecy. Moses gives to the people of Israel seven feasts or festivals that recount their life as the people of God, that they're to do over and over and over again so that they'll remember 
God's big plan. I'll show what that is in just a minute. And ultimately, it is fulfilled in the New Testament. Typology is different than prophecy. Typology is nonverbal. It involves how God used the salvation history that flows from the Old Testament and the New Testament to give us a different form of prophecy, nonverbal, which involves what are called Old Testament types, New Testament antitype. Typology is the use of select Old Testament persons, events, and institutions to foreshadow future New Testament person, events, and institutions that in some manner relate to the person and the work of Jesus Christ, a quote from the supplement you'll get in a couple of weeks. I know it makes your head hurt. But it's important for us to understand the difference between prophecy and typology. We'll keep coming back to these terms so that we understand them, so that we can handle the scriptures accurately. Thirdly, we cannot spiritualize, allegorize, or bring mystical meanings out of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament alike. They don't take the Bible and allegorize or spiritualize. The reason why I'm spending time on this, and I know for some it's going to feel like, wow, this is a piece of steak you're making me choke. Come on, just encourage me a little bit and, and admonish me. I'm strong in admonishing, aren't I not? Over the years, the three years here, I do a pretty good job, no pat on my back, but being a hortatory pastor. I find most of the time I'm encouraging you. Hang in there. Keep the, keep the course. Uh, don't give up. Keep going. God's there. He's going to love you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to walk with you. That's very important. I think as I look back on preaching, I probably overemphasize the hortatory, the exhortation. Moses is exhorting the people of Israel, and he's saying, here are seven festivals to help you remember so that you don't get drawn into the culture. I'm exhorting us this morning to remind us that we cannot come to the Scriptures, and I see it happen again and again, even amongst Bible-believing Christians. We pull some little nugget out, some little crumb, and we think our lives are being changed because we walked away from church feeling a little better about something going on in our life. I want you to walk away from church feeling better about something in your life, being challenged about something in your life. But these crumbs and these pieces fit together in a grand meta narrative. God has a bigger plan. And it's not just me and my little world and my little things that are going on. My little world and my little things that are going on fit into a big grand picture that God has. And I'm going to try in these last few minutes to paint some of that picture for us. It's important for us to see this. Our fourth point under Typology. Our three festivals are types in Israel's salvation history that find greater fulfillment in the New Testament. I've said this a number of ways already. Our three festivals before us this morning, we've spent very little time there. You're most familiar with Passover, studying them on your own. They're a part of Israel's salvation history, but they find even greater fulfillment in the New Testament. Moses tells them, do these seven feasts. Because they depict some aspect of God's covenant redemptive work in their time. And we see it more fully in the New Testament antitype being fulfilled in Christ. Embedded in Israel's history are God's ways of teaching them even before the antitype comes up. And what is God teaching them? Here's one of the two big takeaways this morning. You ready? Look at me and listen carefully. God has a big plan. He is in control of history and it's going somewhere. Keep your eyes on me and watch. People of Israel, in eternity past, God decided to create the world. And he decided to choose you. Why you? Why any of us? And he gave to them deliverance from bondage in Egypt. Egypt. And he brought them into a promised land and he was to give them rest and worship and life. They were to have indeed ways in which they could celebrate covenant relationship with their God. And it is a type that foreshadows ultimate relationship in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The cross and redemption in him. We celebrate it in communion. We sing about it in worship. We read about it in our Bibles. And we're not insignificant, puny little people in a world that don't matter. If we are the saved, the redeemed, those who are following Jesus, we're a part of a big plan that God is unfolding in history. And history's going somewhere and it'll have its ultimate culmination. 
And we're a part of that plan in a few minutes when we leave here to share God's divine rescue plan with the world around us. That's the big picture. That's the big takeaway. Don't ever forget it. This world and the universe and what's going on is God's universe. It's his world and it's his plan unfolding in time, space, history. We do the same thing in our own country. We stop on the 4th of July and we celebrate. And we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we celebrate Washington's birthday and Lincoln's birthday. We get together at Thanksgiving and we celebrate, hopefully, to thank God for being gracious and blessing our nation and watching over it as he has over the years. And so like the people of Israel, we have celebrations like that. How about for us as New Testament Christians, for those of us who are Protestants here this morning, the majority of us, I'm sure, maybe there are a few Roman Catholics visiting, but for us as Protestants, what do we celebrate? We celebrate the Reformation and Luther and justification by grace through faith in Christ alone and John Calvin and later on Wesley and Whitfield. In church history, we study it going back to the early church, and it's a part of our corporate identity. We are something, a part of something bigger than just ourselves. And it would do us well to get our focus at times off of just us. What do I get out of it, and where do I find meaning and purpose? Type is a model or a pattern with an anti-type in the New Testament. We need to keep distinct prophecy and typology. We need to stay away from spiritualizing, allegorizing, and coming up with mystical meanings for Scripture. Words have meaning, and we need to understand type in order to accurately handle the Scriptures. Our three festivals here this morning are types that find greater fulfillment ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ. So what? Don't worry, even as a preacher, I ask the so what. I'm not interested in getting up here every week and just going blah, 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 blah and sharing, you know, I know some information. Here's the information I studied, so here it is. So what? What should Christians do with these festivals? What do we do with them? Turn over in the Bible to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes and he says, don't pass judgment let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, a part of festivals, or with regard to a festival or a feast, reference to the Old Testament, seven festivals or feasts, or a new moon or a Sabbath. Verse 17, absolutely critical. These, all of the festivals, are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The festivals are types that point us to Jesus. How do I read the Old Testament Christianly? I don't make up mystical meanings and, and try to get some sort of application out of it. I read it in the context of salvation history for the people of Israel, how the author intended it, and we see that there are types pointing ahead to the substance of Jesus. Bible study can't get any more exciting than that. Christ is all over the Old Testament. Oftentimes prophesied, many times in the fulfillment of type. Christ is the substance. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 5 and following tells us that these festivals are obsolete. They find their fulfillment in Jesus. The book of Galatians does the same. All of the Bible is about Jesus. All of history is about Jesus, past, present, and future. Brief illustration and word for us of application today. You know this, I've said it multiple times before, I love watching the news. I love watching what's going on in our state in Minnesota. I love watching what's going on in the national scene. I love watching what's going on internationally in the world for Bible prophecy reasons, but I just love watching what's going on. But nine-tenths of it's negative. Listen to the news, and you'll be bummed. Amen? <laughs> Can I get a witness? I mean, seriously. Always at the very end, you ever notice this? There's some real positive little life story kind of thing, you know, about somebody, you know, rescued their dog from the ice, and I love dogs, and that's important and stuff like that, but that comes at the end. But you read the news, and you get discouraged. You read the Bible, and you get encouraged. We're a part of God's unfolding plan, amen? And so, these were things that are a shadow of that which was to come. Christ is the substance. That's what Christians do with these festivals. A similar point, the second one, the church is never asked to observe the festivals. But listen carefully. 
There's nothing in the New Testament that says that we are to live out these seven festivals. But listen carefully. This is very interesting. The Passover is radically transformed by Jesus into communion. I've already touched on communion. I'll admit to you at times, even as one who, whatever service I'm in, I'm facilitating communion. Sometimes it can feel like going through the actions. It's something you're supposed to do. Shame on me and may the Lord convict my heart. When I'm celebrating communion, as I said earlier, I'm celebrating a part of God's grand narrative. His big plan that finds its ultimate focus in the cross and the resurrection of Christ and where history is going in the future. The Passover is radically turned into communion, which is all about Christ. A third, so what? What should Christians do with these festivals? Very, very quickly, what would be the case uh, if, uh, what would, how would you respond to these festivals if you were a Messianic Jew? So what do Messianic Jews do? Do you know what I mean by Messianic Jew? They're Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. What does a Messianic Jew do with the festivals? Many of them, not all of them, will celebrate some of the different parts of the Passover. Some of you might have noticed in the last few weeks one of our dear brothers in Christ here at church, Tim Knutson. Uh, Tim Knutson, that last name sounds very Jewish, doesn't it? <laughs> Knutson Zein. <laughs> doesn't sound very Jewish, does it? Uh, you may not know this, and Tim told me a few years ago, he reminded me recently that his grandmother's Jewish. And he's Jewish bloodline. And the last few weeks, some of you have seen him wearing a kippah or a yarmulke. Uh, is he reverting to Judaism? Absolutely not. Tim believes in salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. He's not reverting the book of Galatians or Acts chapter 15. We've had these discussions. But he's wearing a kippah or a yarmulke that identifies him as being Jewish in bloodline so that he can minister to other people who are Jewish in bloodline and proclaim the fulfillment of Judaism as a person, the Messiah of Jesus. Now, Tim's kind of tall, so you might have to stand on your tippy toes to see his kippah. But just in case you're wondering, many Messianic Jews celebrate some parts of the Passover. Now, we're going to stand and sing here in just a minute, if you guys will come, so we close our service. I want to close with these few statements. I'm not trying to make messages here at First Free Academic, but I am trying to help us handle the Word of God accurately, rightly handling the Word of God. Listen to these closing couple of statements. I want to be transformed more and more into the image and likeness of Jesus, don't you? Listen to this statement. I've thought this and written it down, shared it a number of times over the years in messages. If what I believe, if what I believe the meaning of a text to be is not what the author intended, if what I believe the meaning is not what the author intended it to be, then that truth can't truly transform me. Those are just my own thoughts. I need to handle the Word of God accurately so that I can get to the transformative truths that are there so that my life by the Spirit of God living in me can change me more and more into the image and the likeness of God. His Word is the primary agent for that change. And that's why I'm passionate about the subject and I think it's very, very important. I press on in equipping us for our transformation by the word of God. Let's pray. Stand as I pray. We'll sing in just a minute. Father in heaven, I pray that you would indeed change our hearts and our lives. Turn us more and more into who you want us to be. Father, I pray that we would see the big picture. Just help us to get our focus off of us. <laughs> and we are important. But we're important, important in relationship to you. The big picture that started in eternity past and is going somewhere. So whatever our struggle is today and this week, it's a part of your plan. And we can turn to you as the people of Israel did and the New Testament believers did and as Christians have for 2,000 years. Help us to dig deep into your word. Transform us by the truth that is there. And send us out into the world to share the message of salvation, wonderful, wonderful salvation, rescue and deliverance.
through Jesus. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who's not yet trusted in you, that they'd talk to one of us, that they would recognize that they're not insignificant, that you have a grand plan and you long for them to be in a relationship with you and that they might repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, making you Savior and Lord of their lives. Father, work in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let's sing as we close.